This is the European edition of Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. We bring you the European unicorn startups, founders, regulators, and leaders innovating the rapidly evolving fintech scene today. A truly localized podcast with both English and local language content with some of the world's most well-known hosts and influencers in the fintech sector globally. Join us every week as we explore what makes the European Union a phenomenal proving ground for many of the fastest growing fintech plays in the world today. Okay, let's roll. Welcome to Breaking Banks Europe, which is your fintech podcast about Europe looking beyond Europe. I am Paolo Cironi, sitting in Frankfurt, and I am online with my co-host Ajita Tripathi, who is dialing from London. Today's episode is number 30, and we have two special guests to discuss a profound topic, possibly the topic of all topics, the intersection between technology and theology. I've been on the journey for digital innovation for multiple years, and I saw a growing demand for transparency and purpose on the usage of technology. I like to say that change is not enough. We need progress. Now, progress is about doing good for society, made of human beings, not only clients or consumers, and doing good for the planet, whose resources are not infinite. How do we craft the delicate balance between convenience and dehumanizing automation? What is the role of artificial intelligence? How does it fit within an ethical framework? How can we make sure that digital generates true value? All important questions that cannot be answered after technology is deployed, but need to be asked as we start working with innovation and need to be continuously reviewed as we learn how innovation is used and consumed. So then, today we have two wonderful guests whose work and point of view me and Ajit truly esteem. We will have two 20-minute conversations, starting with Father Paolo Benanti, Professor of Ethics and Bioethics at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, and author of many bestsellers, of which Homo Faber. We will continue with Clara Durodier, the Executive Chairperson of Cognitive Finance, an AI advisory firm, and author of the bestseller, Decoding AI in Financial Services. So then, welcome to both guests. Let me bring on stage Paolo Benanti. Benvenuto. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Paolo, I can't pretend you tell us your life in 30 seconds, so I will give you one minute. Not so bad. Oh, I start as someone that desired to be an engineer, and I start my career in the university, but at one point... I realized that the deeply desire that I got to understand reality with engineer was simple uh, a scheme that let me approximate it uh, uh, with enough precision. And I started looking for something else. That brings me to a lot of different things uh, and at the end point to the Franciscan life. I'm a member of a religious order, uh, really old, actually, because it's in the Middle East. But uh, going on, I continue to study and I focus myself on ethics. And when I got the possibility to make my PhD in the United States at Georgetown University, I would like to focus between ethics and technology all my past life to try to find a kind of point of contact and focusing especially on the last cutting edge of technology that was biotechnology and also the um, computer technology in the form of AI. It could sound strange. Then I discovered that the symbolic logic that is behind the computer basically was taken by one of my friars that lived in 12th century, Raimondo Lugio, in Mallorca, in the island of Mallorca. It's like, you know, when you finish a puzzle, all the dots are connected in something really strange. That is my actual situation. <laughs> Paolo, who invented banking? Oh, that was made by Franciscan, you know, and it's strange in the sense that before Franciscan, we have a classical form of life in the Catholic Church that was escaping from the city, the abbey, 
uh, was something that was outside the city as is an alternative city after the Roman Emperor city collapsed during the history. St. Francis was simple, someone that grew up in, in the middle of a medieval town. And he saw the new commercial class that arise in the middle of the town. He has this kind of feeling of, of interpretation of the city life as something new that has to be lived with. And so Franciscan that start to live in, in the middle of the city has to take in care of how the money could be borrowed and transmitted and conserved because it's not anymore the possession of the land, things that can allow the Europe to grow. We need a more, we could say today, financial services. And then the banking system, the roots of banking system was bring to the people by Franciscan. We make the vows of poverty. So we gifted the bank to the bankers. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure if banking was a good invention anyway, but it has to be an ethical invention. And, and somehow breaking banks is at the intersections between banking and technology. So that is what we want to discuss today. Now, you published a very interesting book uh, whose title is Homo Faber. I think we could possibly translate from Latin like the man who creates ingeniously. Would I be correct? Uh, you know, it is a, a gameplay with Homo sapiens. And in the early modern age, we start to define ourselves in a different way. Uh, before, in the room where we study the human being, over the human being, there is just a question. Know yourself, quote in Socrates. In the early stage, we define ourselves comparing to the most similar being to ourselves. That was at that time an ape. And so Homo is a kind of ape, and we are the special ape with some kind of ingenious. Now, my, the point is, is it still an ape, the more similar thing that we have to us? In the age in which a machine can surrogate a man, and in some situation could perform also better than a human being, are we still so similar to an ape or more similar to a machine? Should we define ourselves in another way or putting in another perspective? It's still good what we have understood of ourselves in this new age in which artificial intelligence and machine could be understood as competitor of the human being in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So there would be competition, there would also be collaboration. I remember you said that technology is not a simple human activity, but, there is, but human nature is a techno-human condition. So basically the two elements are deeply connected. Oh, we can, we can start in this perspective. If you look at uh, uh, another kind of mammal, Things like an elephant. An elephant has inside uh, his nature only need to live. And the famous memory of an elephant is something that will be with the elephant for all the, day, for all the lasting of his life. An elephant don't forget you. Well, if we don't want to lose some of the passages of our discussion tonight, uh, we, don't, we cannot simply bet on our memory. And this is the strange human condition. We are more than our biological condition. There is something more of my biological condition. At, at one point, I developed a notebook with a pen. At another point, I developed my digital notes. And also, if a pandemic condition does not allow us to share together the same room, we develop an, a video conference system. So what is technology? Technology is, uh, in some way, the place where we found this excedence, this much more than our biology condition, that is the condition of the human being. So it's like uh, saying that the human being is an open envelope compared to other species on the planet, uh, which connects elements from outside of the human body, it could be other people, the nature and technology, to create uh, something new. In that process, uh, some things can go fine, others might go wrong. The question is, how do we anticipate the negative outcomes and try to embed an ethical perspective in the utilization of technology? Yeah, just let me underline that it's not a matter of intelligent technology. We was also in the risk 
to extinguish ourselves with a really stupid technology like the nuke bomb. So it's much more a matter of relationship with technology. And the history of the developing of technology already shows us that we can develop something for good and then have really bad developing of it. Just try to think what happened with Nobel and the stabilization of the explosive. So we are in the middle. We have one line of thinking of the philosophy of technology that simply say that the only way to answer to your question is to apply a concept like think twice, cut once, a precautionary system that we should drive everywhere. Honestly, it's not so bad because at least you will be scared or you will have fear of something and you think twice. But my core question is, is it ethic fear-driven or should be good-making driven? Should we do the, be- the good or, we- or we should leave the fear of having some unintended effect? And so we need something different. On my perspective, the real problem is the difference between innovation and development. Please tell us. Think in a different way, fastest way, or something like that. Development uh, is something really different from innovation. Because in some way, intend also the means and also the ends of technology. Basically, a nuke bomb is really innovative if you look at traditional bomb. Could we call it a development? But a new power plant is innovative instead of a cool power plant, but could be also a huge development because can give electricity and, po- and electrical power to huge section of, of, of a country that are without fossil kind of resource. So the difference between development and innovation is just not only focusing on technology, but also put in the middle the ends of that technology applied in that context and with that rules. is a more complex view that has to be questioned before we apply the technology. So a relevant part of my work uh, in banking and uh, technology is about defining uh, a mechanism to build consequentialist ethics uh, in the action of all the agents, being them human agents, uh, or uh, let's say intelligent agents that can be robots or machines. So my typical perspective is that uh, everything needs to be dynamic and we need to be proactive because we don't know necessarily how we're going to use technology in the very end. So just discussing the technology piece doesn't tell us anything in many cases about the fact that it could be good or bad. So if I infuse transparency on the incentives of people, they play the banking game or build technology, If I create transparency in the cost that ad is given to society, being the clients or the group of citizens, and if I'm capable of discussing transparently the potential consequences, I will be able to allow everybody to position, basically to define, to vet, or to regulate in a way that technology brings value, but we do not, if you like, suffer from excess regulation as well as excess fear about technology. Now, you know that uh, artificial intelligence is a growing field of technology, and this is not just technology that the homo fiber might use directly. It's also technology that at some point uh, would be capable to be fiber itself. So how do we therefore forecraft the delicate balance between the ethics of the programmer soon or anytime soon, the ethics of the algorithm to make sure that everything is in the right place. Yeah, probably if you would like to stress the concept of define what we have in face of us, uh, we are facing a uh, uh, machina sapiens, not only a homo sapiens, uh, put in that way. Uh, of course, I really appreciate your game theory about the idea that we can set up a fair game in which the different player can try to achieve the best performance that they can. But looking at, at other kind of utilities, we have to define two kinds of technology. We know a special purpose technology 
for example, when we need to eat, we develop some kind of tools simple to cultivate the land, to allow good the grooming of, of uh, what we would like to harvest. Then during the century, uh, we develop a better stage of technology up to the last one, the self-driven uh, truck that simple cultivate all the land uh, in, the, in the hugest farm. This is a special purpose technology. I have that purpose and the technological development at one point uh, make a jump in the process. Is it AI, something like that? I don't think so. So we have to look at another kind of technology that sometimes happened in the human history and is what is called general purpose technology. Uh, for example, at one point we invented steam power, at another one, electricity. Electricity and steam power has not uh, one use, but they change the way in which we do all the things that we do. And so AI is something like that. It's not something that is for one, things, but it's changing everything that we, we are facing from the things that we know, and we are talking about IoT or intelligent device or smartphone up to the banking system. When we develop a general purpose technology, every time we do that, we define new rules to contain, frame, and define this new layer. If you took to the Red Flag Act that happened in the United Kingdom, when we developed the engine there is a red flag, a man with a red flag that should stay 20 to 30 meters ahead of a, of a car saying, a car is arriving, be careful. Because Simple left the innovation to freedom in a so fast and changing world is not workable to maintain the society as we know before. So everyone agreed that in some way the innovation process when we face a general purpose technology has to be managed, has to be handled. Same thing happened with electricity. And then you have standards, then you have rules, then you have a, a lot of things that try to not be people electrocuted or something like that. Now the same things has to be made and has to be made at political level and also in a bank system. Because an algorithm actor is never tired, is never exhausted to do the same action. It's like an obsessive compulsive, if you would like to make a human parallel, and he's focusing on that. It's really selfish entity. He would like to do what is programmed for. So we need to define new uh, rule for the system to avoid that the system is a Darwinian one that say homo sapiens versus machina sapiens. So I have a question about consciousness and then I want to invite Ajit into this uh, conversation. Paolo, we were both sitting together in the Italian parliament some months ago, listening to Federico Fagin uh, talking about uh, the existence uh, or not of consciousness in the quantum field. Now, the difference between uh, narrow artificial intelligence uh, and general artificial intelligence goes through, I would say, the definition of consciousness. So I have my own definition, which somehow maps into what some research centers are doing around the exponential technologies. So if I say, that is my point of view, that human consciousness comes from a special intensity that we have versus fundamental uncertainty, so the need of surviving and the irreversibility of time, life and death, because we only go in one direction. Therefore, we need purpose. AI will never be general, as Turi might claim, and therefore conscious from an ethical perspective, as long as uncertainty is not built inside the algorithm, opening close brackets, some research centers are trying to build biological algorithms to make sure that uncertainty is not exogenous by endogenous, so that the algorithm doesn't break, but adapts. But at the same time, the algorithm needs to have the sense of time, therefore the sense of purpose, because he will have to justify the synchronization of his own actions against somebody else being another machine or a human being. Now, I don't know if and when that will ever happen, but that is my interpretation of the two conditions upon which artificial intelligence can be conscious. From your perspective, can artificial uh, intelligence be uh, ever conscious? First of all, it's really difficult to say what will happen. But I think that there is a lot of argument that we can uh, present here 
to, to tell us that it's really difficult that we can achieve a general artificial intelligence for a lot of reasons. First of all, there is a really difference between the imitation game that is in the base of artificial intelligence and the problem of a conscience being like me. Because we are saying that, for example, is the, the, is the model of the forgery. If I make a five pound notes and then the fa- my five pound notes, it's not possible to be distinguished from a real one then the value of my paper is five pounds on the market. But they are not the same. Are we convinced that when the machine will be not distinguishable by a human being, it will be the same things? Because the perspective in which we are building up that machine is the forgery one. So first, first argument. The really general, we can go deep and with a lot of sub-argument and things like that, just to say one. The second thing is the difference that we have with a machine. Uh, basically, if I go to neuro, neuroscience, I can describe my perception of pain as an activation of a low voltage channel between my tooth and my brain. It's workable definition, if you agree. And it's that not so make me feel better, but it's okay. Okay. It, it, it's not so different by what happened when I use my hard drive and a little lead light turn on on my desktop. A low voltage signal, it's moving from one place to another. Now, at the end of the day, if the lead light of my desktop was turned on a lot of time, I've worked a lot. If my tooth was making me suffer for all the day, it was a really bad day. The difference between these two answers, what is simple, something that happened and something that could be good or bad for me, it's a difference between something and someone. Now, in which way a machine could be someone if we build up a something? Because there is something that is not computational inside that. At least, but not at last, for the short discussion on general artificial intelligence, there is a really a difference between a machine and a human being on the basic things that we have together. Try to think memory. If a machine does not record all the data that we put in in a perfect way and is not able to give us back this data as we put inside, the machine is broken and we are called a technician to change it. Your memory, my memory, our memory do not work in the same way. The memory has to change. Otherwise, we have a pathological function. If you look at Borges, Funes el Memorioso, it's a narrative that say that a man that cannot forget something it's a crazy one. It's not okay, Paolo, you, you mentioned the five pound uh, note, you mentioned uh, the truth of uh, something or someone, and you mentioned the immutable uh, record system, which calls into question Ajita Tripathi, our expert on blockchain. Yeah, so, so uh, Father, I come from a Hindu tradition and I've studied Buddhism very closely and you know, I've lived in the West most of my life. So I have quite a bit of exposure to the Christian tradition as well. Now, what I notice is that in the West, our religions are anthro, you know, believe uh, somehow assign God the form of, of a human being, as in we are anthropomorphic, as we say, right? Whereas in the East, at least in my tradition, God is like energy, you know, it's everywhere and everything is formed of it. So there is no special treatment for human intelligence or humankind in, in, in my tradition. So everything is formed of the same substance and that substance is God, essentially, that's how we go. So I'm not going to say, you know, which one is correct or incorrect. There's just different models. I think the the question, what you're trying to say, if and if I'm right, is in, in understanding you, is that there is something special or different about, you know, human intelligence. And that simply cannot be simulated by mathematics or the, the fundamental component parts, or like rather the rules of physics that can be later expressed as algorithms, right? Now, if you look at evidence, you know, a growing, a growing body of evidence in both neuroscience as well as artificial intelligence, we are able to simulate more and more functions of the human mind. And if we introduce some level of randomness, 
you know, errors in the system, then we can actually make a machine uh, say things that are unpredictable, just like humans, right? So, so is there really a difference beyond a point and between a simulated uh, intelligence and an actual intelligence if they both effectively do the same thing? Yeah, I think that the difference is that some one of us could say, could, could ask to himself the question, what I should do? And the subject, I, is someone that has an history, has a past, has uh-huh. a present, and project himself to a future. So it's not just a matter of un- unpredictability of the results, you know, right. the randomness. It's also a matter of a, a personal quality that we call our history. And we define ourselves saying... in this time function, you know? Right. So are you saying that the, the living beings have this uh, sense of being, of sense of existence, that is something very unique to consciousness and cannot be created in a machine? Yeah. My, my basic point is the human being and the living being exist and the machine works. Uh-huh. And the difference well said. in these two quality, probably we, we miss the word to better define in this culture and we have to find a better word to describe the difference. But it's the difference that will make a, a machine, not a living being. Well, I would also say, Paolo, that uh, humans are capable of modifying their past because we learn it through experiences. And bad situations can become an opportunity for becoming something else or someone else, basically to improve, which is way more complicated for machines to do. So the timeline of humans uh, is a bit more convoluted than what people expect, even though time is irreversible for everybody. So I really thank you for the conversation today, Paolo. Both me, Ajit, and Clara enjoyed it very much. I invite our audience to stay a couple of seconds online because we have a little break. And we rejoin back to Breaking Banks Europe, inviting Clara Durodier to discuss about AI, business, and once more, theology. Do you want to be part of Breaking Banks Europe? Reach out and learn more about the opportunity to be featured in one of our shows. With over 1.6 million listeners and counting, Breaking Banks Europe is bound to become the place to advance critical dialogue in Europe and the UK fintech scene. Reach out on Instagram or Twitter at Breaking Banks EU or go to www.provoke.fm. Thank you all for staying with us for this amazing episode of Breaking Banks Europe, which is dedicated to technology and theology. We had Father Paolo Benanti in the first half of this episode, and I'm now pleased to welcome our second guest, Clara Durodier. She is the executive chairperson of Cognitive Finance, an AI advisory firm, and she is the author of the amazing bestseller, Decoding AI in Financial Services. Clara, welcome to Breaking Banks Europe. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Clara, you've been very much involved in the field of artificial intelligence consulting. I guess you've been focusing primarily on business strategy and data engineering for financial services. So I would say, what do you see happening in the industry right now? So first of all, my, um, perhaps I should give a little bit of background in, uh, in, my, in my experience so far. I used to do the deeds as a financial services executive. So I worked in financial services in London and I was involved in unpredictable ways with technology starting with 2010. I'm a portfolio manager by training, but somehow I managed to get myself into more executive management and which took me into um, more involvement in technology. And then in 2014, I, I decided to resign to leave financial services. And then I spent uh, the whole of 2015, I spent doing two main things. One was studying trust in humans, because I believe that without trust, we cannot build technology which actually serves our customers and serves and builds sustainable businesses, not ESG sustainable, but profitable businesses financially sustainable businesses. 
And the other thing I did was then I moved into further academic research at the intersection of neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and uh, financial services, specifically wealth management, studying in rather deep elements the episodic memory we all have. So our past experiences seriously dug deep into our subconscious mind and how this episodic memory informs how we save money, how we spend money, and how we invest money. So we we discussed earlier in our show, in your show, about how our history actually decides and shapes how we behave going forward. But actually, sometimes we do things we are not really uh, clear as to why we do them, because we have triggers uh, buried deep down in our in our episodic memory, which we don't understand. So that's what I did in 2015, researching this uh, very unusual intersection. And then I moved into consulting, working primarily with board of directors, advising on the rights, the the responsible adoption of this technology. And then I spent uh, extensive time in shaping narratives and shaping minds of decision makers around what is what is that we build in our in our industry exactly as um, as i we heard in the show earlier today whatever we build starts shaping us so that was my this is my work this is what i do with our consulting uh, side of business so to answer your question what what's happening at the moment in our fin- in, in financial industry as far as technology and ai is concerned my answer is it's a mixed bag. It's an unstructured, not very well thought through mixed bag. So the whole principle, again, which we heard today in the show, think twice, cut once, is not really there in place. And it's a shame because a lot of resources are going into building technology, which is one, not sustainable, two, some, most of the times not scalable. And three is basically money wasted. Um, and actually, I was I was talking to some some executives from McKinsey, and they said um, in a public presentation, which followed our discussion, that seventy five percent of the money spent on digital transformation in financial services actually goes to waste. Even more so, actually. Then I joined that conversation with something else, which Gardner has found out is that. of the money spent on AI developments actually goes to waste. And then we have to wonder why we do that and uh, why we actually misplace much needed financial resources in places where uh, we actually don't derive any substantial value for the business and shareholders. So this is where we spend our time working with decision makers, trying to advise them in, in choosing and selecting the right technology so they don't have to go through all of this financial waste and human resources waste too. So, Clara, we really think alike here. I guess you're by my lunch because I've been inviting the industry for a long while to stop thinking client-centric and start thinking human-centric. The two are the same thing, which will benefit to their implementation of AI technology as well as uh, the utilization of budgets. Now, I remember you saying that uh, we cannot uh, design technology code for humans if we do not understand uh, the human code first. Can you explain a little bit what is the meaning of this message? It's exactly the the reason for which I decided to, to research the intersection of neuroscience, technology, artificial intelligence, and wealth management focusing on episodic memory. To me, it was clear that trying to understand the behavior humans we display is just scratching the surface. Our behavior changes depending on the triggers we are submitted to, either voluntary or involuntary. So it occurred to me that if we don't understand how we are shaped and how our clients actually would benefit from using technology, then we we are wasting all this money and innovation is not progress. I quite like uh, how you you phrased it earlier in the show, uh, Paolo. 
So we want to create progress here. We don't want just innovation for the sake of innovation and breaking things and moving fast just because Silicon Valley showed us that's how we build a, the Facebook of tomorrow, which is, by the way, one would argue a questionable innovation or progress in some, in some form of its existence. So it occurred to me that the, as we move into a year out where we, one, we need to achieve redefining trust with our customers because we've lost it. It's absolutely no shadow of doubt. We've lost it as an industry. And we're moving into an era where technology has become so centric to how we run our businesses. It's really important to answer, to answer the question, how do we build technology which serves to build trust? And trust, by the way, is not built by transparency, as so many people keep saying. We need to be transparent to, be, to build trust. No. Transparency is built through the lack of deception. So it's so important to actually understand these nuances in how all of these values, actually we embed them in how we design the technology we are implementing and which is affecting our clients. So I do spend some of my time uh, not only advising board of directors, but actually working with AI companies which are building this technology. And we, when we design this, this technology, we, we're trying to very hard to answer all of these questions so that when the code is created, it's designed to help humans better understand themselves and also create a space of trust through the lack of deception. Cambridge Analytica happened because not because they lacked uh, transparency. They were absolutely transparent with selecting, uh, uh, offering those tests for people. They, they were very clear uh, what they wanted to do. They were transparent to some extent, but it was the deception element in which they used the data they collected to manipulate people. That's actually what created the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal. So, if we don't understand the human code, if we don't understand ourselves, in other words, then we will never be able to actually design technology which helps, which becomes customer-centric so that we build trust with our customers. Well, I would so, say myself, Clara, if I can, that uh, we need uh, a slightly broader definition of the transparency principle, even for the Cambridge Analytica story, because that is not just about... Uh, the incentives uh, or the cost, but also the consequences that need to be discussed. And this could be like a test that we can ask anybody to run when they implement technology, forcing them to ask themselves uh, what could potentially happen because that aggregates a variety of conversations on a field which is innovation that by definition doesn't necessarily have borders. However, I'm really curious to know how you think of uh, infusing uh, an ethical perspective, so a, a, a human-centric perspective uh, inside the field of uh, AI and, and innovation. And then I also want to listen to Ashit later on. So how would you do that? So the, the, in my work, when I, I do it two ways. One, through consultancy and through discussing and sharing with decision makers, so the people who actually sign the checks, sign the investments in technology. So I explained, I share with them some of the frameworks which we use to evaluate different technologies and different technology vendors in financial services. And to us, a central point in, in these frameworks is the design of technology to avoid deception. Because that, again, that deception is where trust breaks down. So the other way in which I implement this ethical approach to designing technology is when we work with AI companies which are building their products and then selling them to financial services. We have dedicated frameworks which we've built over the years to evaluate not only the technology, but also the ethical impact of that technology, not only on the business, but also on the customers. And it's come to, to us time and again, very clear position that everything we do, all these frameworks which we designed, actually 
they're they're complex they are but the core of them it's very simple like anything else good in life complexity doesn't necessarily brings value simplicity in contrast it it allows us to focus on on what is really important and when we design this and sub- implement this this ethical frameworks we have one simple core value at the center of them all which is are we good for humans are we here are we deploying this technology to in, to help humans live a better life in an equal way or are we exacerbating inequality or are we making use of of the data we collect to do other things what what do we do here so human centric technology is what drives us and what shapes our thinking around uh, evaluating systems which we build and then are, are being deployed in in financial services ajit can you share your point yeah so i have a i have a question and it's slightly argumentative just to add a bit of spice to this conversation so clara I, you know it's a, i think i have a fundamental question about whether technology is ethical or can ever be ethical so let's think about nuclear weapons right so it's the same technology that was used to bomb hundreds of thousands of people and it's the same technology that has been used to generate a lot of energy and you know to cure cancer and so on through radiology so it's not so much the technology which in my argument which is ethical or unethical it's the application and as humans choose to do it then further is there really a universal set of ethics you know so we i could we, we could say that nuclear weapons ended the world war and saved many many lives and we could also say that nuclear weapons essentially posed a great threat to humanity so ethics so i have two arguments here that i would like to ask you about the first is is can technology ever be ethical or is te- isn't technology value neutral right it's how we apply it in the application of the technology and the second part is is there a universal set of global ethics that applies to all cultures and entire humanity that we can claim to be applying to technology or is it really de- does it really depend on the context for example in china privacy is not that big a deal in germany privacy is a huge deal so uh, what do you have to say about that well technology is a tool and we're talking about ai here and it's uh, in financial services it's it should be used as a or it is a tool for business growth um, the work we do is to help companies deploy ethical ai for business growth and profitability so technology wherever it is is used in my view it should be used as a tool but a tool becomes a weapon in the hands of the user so let's take a very simple example a vase a glass okay or a chair there are tool you you use a chair to sit on it comfortably so you can we can have this conversation here or uh, you type your emails or do your work but that same chair the tool for your comfort and uh, longevity in front of your computer can very easily become a weapon when you lift it and throw it at someone in order to attack that person so is the same thing with technology and that's why it's so incredibly important that the application of this technology it's done from the onset with this ethical values responsible values in mind sadly it's not the case and it's not the case because let's think for a little bit how this technology comes to exist uh, some people invest money in it usually there are vcs So venture capitalists put a lot of money in it. Talk to any of them, well not any of them, the majority of them as I do pretty much every day. And you will be absolutely shocked at how blinded they are to spend money only on how we're going to make even more money. Doesn't matter how we're going to make it, but show me the money. So that's where we also push the conversation is not part of our work, but we spend extensive amount of time with vcs which are part of our of our investment panel and we have selected in our investment panel vcs who share this idea of investing in ethical ai from the beginning and then once the technologies is found the money to grow 
then is it becomes life it becomes a product but in order to become a product is being coded is being created built by some people the value the morality of those people everything what they think is right or wrong is embedded in the way they design every single line of code their own biases their own episodic memory their own triggers are being built in every single line of that technology and that's why it's so important to ensure that we we build ethical tools we embed we build teams of people coders who have different backgrounds and different cultural makeups so we can capture different nuances so when this product is up and there up and running it does not impact negatively on on people who don't belong of the cultural or social group of those who coded that technology and i think with that i address the second part of your question ajit uh, with regards to is there a technology are there ethical standards uh, universally ap- applicable the answer the short answer to that uh, is probably not but that comes again comes from me and i could be biased but i think it's a good bias to have i have grown up and traveled extensively in the world and i have a sincere respect for different cultures and sensitivity for what people believe and this level of respect needs to be embedded in the in the systems in the ethics frameworks which we design but also in the way we build each technology in question there's a lot to say about this this two points which you raised and to summarize what i've just said uh, technology is a tool which can easily become a weapon in the hands of the user and we need to be sensitive of cultural differences and we need to embed them in how we design this technology because here's the thing as we said in the show today ai is a general purpose technology and i completely agree with that it's like electricity and steam power it changes everything it is changes how we live our lives and how we we think about life in general our work but we need to be realistic and accept that if there are people who won't be touched equally by this general purpose technology and we already live in a society which is uh, where inequality is quite substantial and the wrong deployment or the wrong design of this technology will only make that inequality even more sizable so and that I... has implications in 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 how we live our lives in the future Yes, Clara, that's the reason why in the coding AI and financial services, you say that we need to understand the human code first before we start coding technology. Now, I thank you for uh, your participation to Breaking Banks Europe. Uh, you've been here today together with uh, Gitri Fati, my co-host, uh, and Paolo Benanti. Basically, we started with Fara Paolo Benanti, a theologist, uh, and thanks to Clara Durodier, we turned a theologist into a banker because we said that the two need to start uh, to go together. So thank everybody for uh, your attendance to Breaking Banks Europe today. This was the episode uh, number 30. Don't forget to follow us on your preferred social media podcast, visit our uh, website uh, and stay tuned for more amazing episodes. That's a wrap. Thanks for listening to Breaking Banks Europe, a Provoke Media podcast in cooperation with Fintech Stage. Don't forget to tweet us out, shout out or post to the team at Breaking Banks EU on Twitter. If there's something or someone you'd like to hear on our cast, let us know. See you next week on Breaking Banks Europe.